Chapter 8 of Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Crouched at the edge of the jungle, where the clearing began, Paula heard four shots, two in quick succession, and a wait of minutes, then a third, and another long wait, and then the last. Then silence. Paula began to shiver. Bell had helped her ashore from the raft and insisted on her waiting at the edge of the jungle. Not that you'll be any safer, he had told her grimly, but that I may be. One person can move more quickly than two, and if I'm chased, I'll plunge for the place you're hidden, and you can open fire. Then the two of us might hold them off. Why, said Paula slowly, and Bell caught at her wrist. Don't let me hear you talk like that, he said sharply. We're going to beat this thing. We've got to. And being desperate helps, but being in despair doesn't help a bit. Buck up. He frowned at her until she smiled. I will not despair again without your permission, she told him. Really, I will not. He found her a hiding place and went cautiously out into the clearing, still frowning. He had been gone five minutes before the first shot sounded, and quite ten before the last rang out dully, and was echoed and re-echoed hollowly by the jungle trees. And Paula lay waiting by the edge of the clearing, Ribiera's pearl-handled automatic in her hand. Bell had carried the rifle from the plane. Small insects moved all about her, and she heard soft rustlings as the life of the jungle went on over her head and under her feet, and terror welled up in her throat. She was trembling almost uncontrollably when Bell came back. He walked openly toward her hiding place. Paula? She came out, trying to steady her quivering lips. We're all right, said Bell grimly. This is the fazenda of a subdeputy, I suspect. Also, it's an emergency landing field for Ribiera on the way to that place he talked to last night. There's a two-place plane here, with both wheels and floats, in a filthy little shed. It seems to be all right. We're going to take off in it and try to make moradores, where your people are. What's the matter? Her face was deathly pale. I thought, she said with some difficulty, when I heard the shots, I thought you were killed. Bell shook his head. I wasn't, he said grimly. It was four other men who were killed. He led her carefully past the house. It was a fairly typical fazenda dwelling. It was more substantial than most. It was wholly unpretentious, with whitewashed walls, and the effect of grandeur it would give to natives of this region would come solely from the number of buildings. There were half a dozen or more. I killed four men, repeated Bell coldly and I'm damned glad of it. That scream we heard. I know pretty well what happened here last night. Remember, Ribiera spoke of using a beam wireless to make his report. He must have had a short-wave beam set somewhere on the outskirts of Rio, aimed at whatever headquarters he reports to. He's going up to that headquarters sometime today, by plane, of course. He needed emergency landing fields along the route. And here he picked out a native, and made him a sub-deputy. Charming. Moving past the buildings, Paula caught sight of massive wooden bars set in the side of a building. Something crumpled up and limp lay before them. Don't look over there, said Bell harshly. There was a woman in this house, and she told me what happened, though I'd guessed it before. The sub-deputy was here last night, with a party of friends. Newly enslaved, some of them. He entertained them. Up at Ribera's place, a girl told me she and her husband had been shown a secret service man. He went mad before their eyes. It was an object lesson for them, a clear illustration of what would happen to them if they ever disobeyed. I imagine that something of the sort is used by all the master's deputies to convince their slaves of the fate that awaits them for disobedience. The local man had brought a party up to watch two men go mad. After that sight, they'll be obedient. 
He reached the shed, huge but in disrepair. Monster doors were ajar. Bell heaved at them and swung them wide. A small, trim, two-seated plane showed in the shadowy interior. This is for emergency use, said Bell grimly, and we face an emergency. I'll get it out and load it up. There's a dump of gas and so on here. You might look around outside the door in case the one man who got away can find someone to help stop me. He set to work checking on fuel and oil. He loaded extra gas in the front cockpit, a huge tin of it. Another would crowd him badly in the pilot's cockpit in the rear, but he stowed it as carefully as he could. The local sub-deputy, he added evenly, has added to the thrill by having two men put in one cage. He let his guest observe the progress of the madness the damned poison produces, and presently, as the madness grew, the two men fought. They were murder-mad. The local sub-deputy gave his guests the thrill of watching maniacs battling to the death. He left early this morning with his party, and I imagine that everyone was suitably submissive to his demands for the future. There were four men and a woman left as caretakers here. I found the four men before the cage, baiting the poor devil who killed the other last night. That's why we heard the scream. When I came up with my rifle, they stared at me and ran. I got one of them, and as a matter of mercy, I put a bullet through the man who had gone murder-mad. The bell sounded as if he were actually nauseated. The man he killed was still in the cage. My God! Then I went looking for the other three men. Wasting time, no doubt, but I found them. I was angry. I got one, and the others ran away again. A little later, the third man jumped me with a knife. He slit my sleeve. I killed him. Didn't find the fourth man. Bell moved to the front of the plane. I'll see if she catches. He swung on the stick. It went over stiffly, again and again. With a bellow, the motor caught. Bell shouted in Paula's ear. We'll get in. Use the warming-up period to taxi out. We want to get away as soon as we can. He helped her up into the seat, then remembered. He rummaged about and flung a tumbled flying suit up into the cockpit with her. If you get a chance, put it on, he shouted. He stepped into a similar outfit, reached up, and throttled down the motor, and kicked away the blocks under the wheels. He vaulted up into place, and slowly and clumsily the trim little ship came lurching and rolling out of the shed. The landing field was not large, but Bell took the plane to its edge. He faced it about, and bent below the cockpit combing to avoid the slipstream and look at his maps again. Brought from the big amphibian. Something caught his eye. Another radio receiving set. Amphibian planes, he muttered, for landing on earth or water. And radios. I wonder if he has directional for a guide. It would seem sensible, and if the plane went down, the rest of them would know about where to look. Paula reached about and touched his shoulders. She pointed. There was a movement at the edge of the jungle, and a puff of smoke. A bullet went through the fuselage of the plane, inches behind Bell. He frowned, grasped the stick, and gave the motor the gun. It lifted heavily, like all amphibians, but it soared over the group of buildings, some twenty or thirty feet above the top of the wireless mast, and went on, rising steadily to clear even the topmost trees on the farther side of the stream by a hundred feet or more. It went on and on, roaring upward, and the jungle receded even farther below it. The horizon drew back and back. At two thousand feet, the earth began to have the appearance of a shallow platter. At three thousand feet, it was a steep-sided bowl, and Bell could look down and trace the meandering of the stream on which he had landed the night before. Not too far downstream, some fifteen miles, perhaps, or the squalid, toy-sized structure of a town of the far interior of Brazil. He never learned its name. 
but even in his preoccupation with the management of the plane and a search for landmarks, he wondered very grimly indeed what would be the state of things in that town. If in Rio, where civilization held sway, Ribiera exercised such despotic, though secret power, in a squalid and forgotten little village like this, the rule of a sub-deputy of the master could be bestial and horrible beyond belief. Eastward, Bell had overshot the mark the night before. Before he had located himself, he was quite fifty miles beyond the spot Paula had suggested as a hiding place. Now he retraced his way. A peak jutting up from far beyond the horizon was a guiding mark. He set the plane's nose for it and relaxed. The motor thundered on valorously. Far below was a vast expanse of thick jungle, intercepted but nowhere broken by occasional small streams and now and then the tiny angular things which might be houses. But houses were very infrequent. In the first ten miles, with a view of twenty miles in every direction, Bell picked out no more than four small groups of buildings, which might be unspeakably isolated fazendas of the folks of this region. Riviera is coming this way, he muttered. He fumbled the headphone of the radio set into place. The set seemed to be already arbitrarily tuned. He turned it on. There was a monotonous series of flashes, with a sinking note of a buzzer in them. A radio directional signal. Ribiera's on the way. Bell stared far ahead without reason, and it seemed to him that just then, against the far distant guiding peak, he saw a black speck floating in mid-air. He pulled back the joystick, detached, feathery clouds spread across the sky, and he was climbing for them. Paula looked behind at him, and he pointed. He saw her seem to stiffen upon sight of the other aircraft. In minutes, Bell's plane was tearing madly through the sunlit fleecy monsters, which looked soft and warm and alluring, and were cold and damp and blinding in their depths. Bell kept on his course. The two planes were approaching each other at a rate of nearly two hundred miles an hour. And then, while the harsh, discordant notes of the radio signal sounded monotonously in his ears, Bell stared down, and through a rift between two clouds saw the other plane for an instant a thousand feet below. The sun shone upon it fiercely. Its propeller was a shimmering, cobwebby disk before it. It seemed to hang motionless, so short was Bell's view of it, between earth and sky, a fat, glistening body as of a monstrous insect. Bell could even see figures in its cockpits. Then it was gone, but Bell felt a curious hatred of the thing. Ribiera was almost certainly in it, headed for the place to which he had spoken the night before, and Bell was no longer able to think of Ribiera with any calmness. He felt a personal, gutsy hatred for the man and all he stood for. His face was grim and savage as his own plane sped through the clouds. But just as the two aircraft had approached each other with the combined speed of both, so they separated. It seemed only a moment later that Bell dipped down below the clouds and the other plane was visible only as a swiftly receding moat in the sunlight. I wonder, said Bell coldly to himself, with the thunder of the motor coming through the singing of the air route signal, I wonder if he'll see the ship I cracked up last night. Paula was pointing, the shoulder of a hill upthrust beneath the jungle. The tall trees were cleared away at its crest. Small, whitewashed buildings appeared below. Good landing field, said Bell, his eyes narrowing suddenly. On the direct route, fifty miles back, there's another landing field. I wonder. He was already suspicious before he flattened out above the house, while dogs fled madly. He noticed, too, that horses in a corral near the buildings showed no signs of fright, and horses are always afraid of landing aircraft 
unless they have had much opportunity to grow accustomed to them. The little plane rolled and bumped and gradually came to a stop. Bell inconspicuously shifted a revolver to the outer pocket of his flying suit. Figures came toward them with a certain hesitating reluctance that changed Bell's suspicions even while it confirmed them. Paula, he said grimly, this is another landing field for Ribiera's emergency use. It sticks out all over the place. Relatives or no relatives, you want to make sure of them, you understand? Her eyes widened in a sudden, startled fear. She caught her breath sharply. Then she said quietly, though her voice trembled, I understand, of course. She slipped out of the plane and advanced to meet the approaching figures. There were surprised, astounded exclamations. A bearded man embraced her and shouted. Women appeared, and after staring, embraced. Paula turned to wave her hand reassuringly to Bell and vanished inside the house. Bell looked over his instruments, examined the gas in the tank, and began to work over his maps in the blaring sunlight. He cut out the switch, and the motor stopped with minor hissings of compression. The maps held his attention, though he listened keenly as he worked for any sign of trouble that Paula might encounter. He was beginning to have a definite idea in his mind. Ribiera had talked to a headquarters somewhere by beam radio from Rio. Beam wireless, of course, is nothing more or less than a concentration of a radio signal in a nearly straight line, instead of allowing it to spread about equally on all sides of the transmitting station. It makes both for secrecy and economy, seeing nearly all the power used at the sending apparatus is confined to an arc of about three degrees of a circle, directed to a given receiving station, receiving outfits to one side or the other of that path are unable to listen in, and the signal is markedly stronger in the chosen path. Exactly the same process, of course, is used for radio directional signals, one of which still buzzed monotonously in Bell's ear until he impatiently turned it off. A plane in the path hears the signal. If it does not hear the signal, it is demonstrably off the straight route. Bell, then, was in a direct line for Rio, to the source of a radio direction signal. Fifty miles back, where the big amphibian had crashed, he was in the same airline. To extend that line on into the interior would give the destination of Ribiera, with the location of the headquarters where direct communication with the master was maintained. He worked busily. His maps were in separate sheets, and it took time to check the line from Rio. When he had finished, he computed grimly. At a hundred miles an hour, he was figuring the maximum distance, which could plausibly be accepted as a day's journeying by air. He surveyed the maps again. The plateau of Cuyaba at a guess. Hmm. Fleets of aircraft could practice there and never be seen. An army could be maneuvered without being reported. Certainly the headquarters of the whole continent could be there. Striking distance of Rio, Montevideo, Buenos Aires, La Paz, and Asuncion. Five republics. Certainly, from his figures, it seemed plausible that somewhere up on the plateau of Cuyaba, where no rails run, no boats ply, and no telegraph line penetrates, which juts out ultimately into that unknown region, where the Rio Zinga and the Tapajo have their origins. Certainly, it seemed plausible that there must lie the headquarters of the whole ghastly conspiracy. There it might be the deadly plants from which the master's poison was brewed were grown. There the deadly stuff was measured out and mixed with its temporary antidote. Paula came back, a young man with her. Her eyes were wide and staring, as if she had looked upon something vastly worse than death. He, Riviera, she gasped, my uncle. He owned this place. They have him. 
here, alive and mad, and all the rest. Bell fumbled in the pocket of his flying suit. The young man with Paula was looking carefully at the plane, and there was a revolver in a holster at his side. An air of grim and desperate doggedness was upon him. This is my cousin, gasped Paula. He and his wife and, and... The young man took out his weapon. He fired. There was a clanging of metal, the screech of tortured steel. Bell's own revolver went off the fraction of a second too late. You may kill me, senor, said the young man through stiff lips. His revolver had dropped from limp fingers. He pressed the fingers of his left hand upon the place where blood welled out just above his right elbow. You may kill me, but if you and my cousin Paula escape, I have a wife, senor, and my mother, and my children. Kill me if you please. It is your right. But I have seen my father go mad. Sweat, the sweat of agony and of shame, came out upon his face. I fought him, senor, to save the lives of all the rest, and I have spoiled your engine, and I have already sent word that you and Paula are here, not for my own life, but... He waited, haggard and ashamed, and desperate and hopeless. But Bell was staring at the motor of the airplane. Crankcase punctured, he said dully. Aluminum. The bullet went right through. We can't fly five miles, and Ribiera knows we're here, or will. End of Chapter 8